Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Anthea Hartig, the Elizabeth McMillan Director of the National Museum of American History. Good evening, and thank you so much for being here. On behalf of our board, my incredible staff, our volunteers, our broader Smithsonian family, I am overjoyed to welcome you to your National Museum of American History and the sixth Great Americans Awards Program. I hope you're ready for a very exciting night. I certainly am. I'd like us to pause and acknowledge that we're gathered here today on the native lands of the Piscataway and their descendants. The Chesapeake Bay region is home to many indigenous peoples and we recognize and honor their presence and give our respect and our gratitude for the opportunity to be here tonight. And secondly, this of course is a theater. It might feel a bit formal, but please feel free if you need to move around or get up. We want you to feel welcome, comfortable, safe, and at home in our museum. We're incredibly honored to steward an amazing collection and this remarkable building on behalf of all of you, the American people, and we consider that a great honor. So we have a few special guests. Of course, all of you are special. Um, our Smithsonian Regent, the Honorable Barbara Barrett, our Provost and Undersecretary of Museums, Education and Research, Dr. John Davis is joining us. We have a number of our board members, I think including David Frederick and maybe Scott Berg flew in from Los Angeles. Um, we're joined by Paul Simon's incredible wife, um, the amazing Edie Burkell. Thank you. Um, so many of us love and respect tonight's honoree that we had to even think about accommodating more people in another location. So if there's anybody out there in the ether who are listening uh, to us, thank you for joining us even remotely. We remain deeply grateful for the generosity of David M. Rubenstein, the chair of the Smithsonian Board of Regents, who supports our Great Americans Awards Program and so much important cultural and historic work. The Washington Monument, which he um, helped restore, opens up tomorrow, so thanks to his generosity. <laughs> I can't wait to climb all the way to the top. So, we're honored tonight to present the Great American Medal to recording artist, songwriter, and philanthropist, Paul Simon. During his distinguished career that spans over six decades, Paul Simon has written and recorded music that has been the soundtrack of many of our lives. It resonates with us, it helped inform and challenge the times, Bridge Over Troubled Water, Sound of Silence, Graceland, just a few of his masterpieces. And as an institution that honors, collects, and interprets American history, his work particularly excites us. Just as his music is timeless, it is simultaneously deeply rooted in very specific moments of the 20th and early 21st century. He explores and helps us touch politics, culture, our national mood, our love, and our lives. He is also an artist of immense creativity and talent and has been celebrated throughout his career and honored by many. And tonight, of course, we're so grateful that we get to bestow upon him the Smithsonian's Great American Medal. And of course, he's only the sixth person to receive it. Since its inception in 2016, the Great American Awards Program has celebrated those who not have only devoted their life and, and creativity and service to create a lasting impact, but whose philanthropic and humanitarian endeavors set them apart. The medal itself was inspired by a double eagle $20 coin in our numismatic collection and it honors the recipient's accomplishments and influence on American history and the deep connections of stories told throughout our collections and exhibitions and programs for a broader understanding of our remarkable American experience, our shared 
democracy, and our core values. So this is exactly why we're here tonight, to honor Paul Simon. A world-renowned composer, an incredible artist, a music innovator, a dedicated advocate for children's health, biodiversity, and conservation, and yes, of course, a very loyal and devoted Yankees fan. In an interview in 1967 in The New Yorker, after headlining the seminal Monterey Pop Festival that year, Paul Simon shared this. I used to think I was much sharper than everyone else, very aware, perceptive, seeing things. And then recently, I realized that that wasn't true. Everyone's perceptive. They all know what pain is. I have deep compassion for that. There's a gentleness and an understanding in young people today. And in the end, there's only one choice. The human race must come to the aid of the human race. Thank you, Paul, for those beautiful and prescient, those beautiful and prescient words, and then through living them through your action and through your life and through your philanthropy. On a personal note, uh, Paul Simon has long occupied layers of my life soundtrack and poetry. I remember the day that my family went together to buy Bridge Over Troubled Water. I listened to that album over and over again, and as a girl, I was thinking maybe we could do a little sing-along or throw down, but I think he might win. Um, but it truly became a part of me. Graceland remains one of my all-time favorites with its inclusive global elegance and power. And I'm truly thrilled and honored that I get to spend the evening with all of you honoring him. I know, of course, that my story is not unique, that Paul Simon has touched so many of us. So please join me in watching a short video to learn more about the reach of his artistic vision and his philanthropic work. And thank you again for joining us. The mystery of music is what I think sustains us. As a singer and songwriter, Paul Simon has shaped how we listen and appreciate music for more than six decades. Losing love is like a window in your heart And I have come to look for America Oh, the poor Give us those nice bright colors Give us those dreams Using lyrics and beats to not only broaden our understanding of the world, but to affect social change in the United States. Paul, to me, is like a, almost like a painter and a screenwriter, the way he writes songs. I don't want no part of the because he makes me see things when he writes. A lifelong devotion to the power of music, humanitarianism, and philanthropy places Paul Simon on the chart of great Americans. Raised in Queens, Paul dreamt of playing for the Yankees. But when his father gave him a guitar and taught him a few chords, he was hooked. In high school, he began to compose and harmonize with a friend, Art Garfunkel, the teenage act first known as Tom and Jerry. I write music and lyrics absolutely separately. I, the music comes first, sometimes the rhythm comes first if it's a rhythm tune, and then I play a guitar part over the rhythm. Let me get the chords for it before I get the note. I can hear the soft breathing of the girl that I love. During the 1960s, the duo now known as Simon and Garfunkel had hit after hit. Parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme. Songs that we could sing along with. But songs that also reflected the unease in America. Songs that motivated us to action. We spoke up for who we were in our generation. 1970 brought one of their biggest successes, the Bridge Over Troubled Water album. It sold over 25 million copies, becoming one of the top sellers of all time. 
First time I heard it on the radio, I, I knew that it was a hit because it sounded huge just with the voice and the piano. But the duo split soon after, and Paul began to look for inspiration elsewhere, from the streets of New York to around the globe. Despite a cultural boycott of South Africa, Paul went there at the invitation of local musicians, turning what felt like a controversial move into a cross-border collaboration. I thought, what the heck, this is a chance in a million, we must do this. If our music gets a chance to be part of mainstream music, surely that can't do any harm. We were really learning how to combine different musical ideas. The 1986 album, Graceland, was a breakthrough, a worldwide phenomenon. I've been doing music professionally since I'm 15 years old, and in many ways, Graceland was the most significant achievement of my career. People say she's crazy, she got diamonds on the soul of her shoes. From Mandela to the Muppets, from the Dalai Lama to Obama, the songs of Paul Simon are a language all the world sings. Challenging, comforting, and inspiring. Paul has a, a special magic. Nobody has that magic. Paul has won a slew of awards, including 16 Grammys. A lifelong Yankees fan, Paul now spends the majority of his talents and time on charitable causes, founding the Children's Health Fund in 1987, which provides mobile medical clinics to homeless and underserved families, contributing to conservation projects in Hawaii, and working to protect biodiversity around the world. During his farewell tour in 2018, Paul donated proceeds from each concert to local organizations. It means more than you can know. A remarkable performer devoted to his craft, writing songs which have had a profound impact on popular culture, a philanthropist willing to use his talents to help the most vulnerable. Paul Simon's next act, one of the Smithsonian's great Americans. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome David M. Rubenstein, Chair of the Smithsonian Institution Board of Regents, and Paul Simon, recording artist, songwriter, and philanthropist. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, um, thank you very much for coming this evening and uh, giving us some of your time. And what we're going to do is have a conversation, a little about your career and how you came to be such a famous songwriter and performer. But many people don't know that you actually, when you were younger, growing up in New York, you were really interested in being a professional baseball player. So have you ever thought how your life would be much better had you actually succeeded in becoming a professional baseball player? And have you ever wondered? Uh, could you have made it to the major leagues, and why did you decide not to go into Major League Baseball? <laughs> At a certain point, I realized that most of the major leaguers were about a foot taller than I was, <laughs> <laughs> and that it was unlikely that I was going to. But anyway, by that point, I was already completely interested in music. But you, uh, so I played, I played one year in uh, high school, and, uh, and I made the all-star team of Queens. <laughs> but. Uh, and then uh, when I went to college, I, I really was only interested in uh, r you know, writing music, making records, and stuff like okay. that. You went to college because your parents wanted you to go to college, or but you really wanted to go to college rather than just be a musician? Well, everybody in the world that I grew up in, everybody went. You know, it was everybody. You didn't think that you would not go. Your father was a professional musician. So did that rub off on you, or was that not really related to why you became a musician? Well, I'm sure that that was something that had a big effect upon me. But 
the music that I liked was completely different from the music that he played. I mean, our, my generation, unlike my children's generation, was separated with a, a virtual chasm uh, as far as music went. He was of the big band era, and, uh, and I became interested in music when rock and roll first okay, so appeared. When when you started writing songs, did you take them to your father and say, Dad, what do you think about these songs? You're professional. And did he say, these aren't so good, or what? Well, when uh, I started, you know, I started writing songs when I was about 13. My father gave me a guitar uh, when I was 12 or 13, and I started to write songs. And I, would start to, and I was singing with my friend, Art Garfunkel, who lived a few blocks away. And uh, we would write, to, write songs together, and we would send them in to Library of Congress to have them copyrighted. OK. <laughs> All right. And in, in fact, and my father would notate the music. He would, he would write it down, because we couldn't write music. And uh, a few years ago, when I received the, uh, the Gershwin, the Gershwin Award, Award right. At the, uh, I was at the Library of Congress, and they showed me the manuscript that my father, that my father wrote. So you, you mentioned that you couldn't write music uh, and read, read music, but you, you still have never learned to read music. Has that been a handicap in your career? <laughs> well, I'll tell you a good story. <laughs> Wynton Marsalis, who's one of my, one of my close friends, uh, we were talking one night, and he said, I, I, he was working on a violin concerto, and he said, yeah, I wish I had, uh, had really paid more attention to uh, orchestration when I was studying. He said, I, 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 you know, I studied it, but I really didn't get into it. I said, I know what you mean. I always regretted that I never, uh, you know, learned how to Notate. Well, I could scribble a th scribble a thing down, but it's uh, next to next to being illiterate. But although I do know I do know harmony, I studied harmony. I know that. But uh, and I said, gee, I always regretted this. And he said, well, you don't need that. You don't. You know. He said. He said uh, because you hear. He said, my father, his father was uh, Ellis Marsalis, was also a great, is a great musician. He said, when I was about 15 years old, he said, I was making fun of this older New Orleans trumpet player who couldn't read music. He said, because uh, I could you know, do all of that. And he said, my father said to me, yeah, he can't read, but he can play. He said, you can read, but you can't play. <laughs> well, you obviously can play. Um, so. Um, you formed a band uh, early on. It was called Tom and Jerry. Right. It was a, yeah. It was a, like a duo. Or two, duo, not right. a band. A duo. So where did the name Tom and Jerry come from? Because that wasn't your name, and where did that come from? Well, the cartoon characters. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, we didn't pick it. Okay. Our record company uh, picked it. In that those days, which was the late '50s, it was out of the question that anybody would use their names if they were, uh, you know, an, an ethnic, right. an ethnic name. You know, even when we recorded as Simon and Garfunkel, that was a, a kind of a breakthrough. The president of Columbia Records at that time, he, he said, no, that's your name, that should be the name. Because they were trying to come up with all different names that they would call us, and no, he said, no, use that, use that name. So, so the Tom and Jerry was, well, you know, it just, worked out okay. Just a kid's, but, just a uh, kid's name. But um, I went to law school, and I went for three years, and I wish I hadn't done it. You went for one semester, dropped out. So why did you even think of going to law school? Mm. <laughs> uh, nice Jewish boy from uh, New York, right? Well, not nice and barely Jewish. Uh, from New York, right. yeah. Okay. Well, you know, law school, that was just one of these things where I had, I, I, was, a, I was an English literature major. And, uh, but all of my, a bunch of my friends were taking the law boards 
Uh, and uh, I said, well, well, I'll take them too. So I took the law boards and I scored very high on the law board. So I thought, oh, well, I, I don't know, maybe I'm supposed to be a lawyer, you know? So uh, <laughs> I, I went to, I went to uh, Brooklyn Law School for, uh, for uh, a year. Uh -huh. <laughs> and in the midterms, I got all Bs and things like that when I wasn't trying at all. And I right. said, wow. Uh, but uh, by the time the year was over, I'd gotten D's, and okay. you know, I, <laughs> well, and I, I, mean, I kept thinking, I don't know why I'm here. I, 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 I want to be playing music and hiring lawyers to okay, right. do this. I don't want to work for, so, for a musician. So trust me, you didn't miss anything by not competing law school. But um, when you were writing songs, you went to England for a while. You lived there, and you were trying out your songwriting skills. And did that help you a lot by being in England at the time? Yeah. It helped me because I was performing a lot. And so I learned how to be on, I learned how to perform there, really. You know, uh, you know, like the Beatles playing, you know, all these clubs all around in Germany and everywhere. You do it night after night and you learn okay. you know, how, to be a, how to be a performer. So your, the first song that you wrote that became very, very famous was The Sound of Silence, I think. Is that right? right? So where, did you write that in England or in the, in the United States? And did you United, know? United, in America. And did you know right away this was really going to be a hit? Or did people tell you it wasn't going to be a hit? No, I didn't know. Nobody said that either. What I did think was that it was the best of the songs that I had written at that point. Uh, but it really was uh, this phenomenon of of like, I don't know what you would call, you can call it different things, flow or a zone. You become a conduit and the, the music or whatever your creative process is, it comes through you and it's yours, but it's almost like you didn't write it. So I didn't know at that point, because I was 22 years old, that such a thing could happen. So I just thought, hmm, that's oh, wait, it's pretty it's pretty good for what I'm doing at the moment. So, uh, uh, <laughs> what would your father thought it was a pretty good song too? I think so, yeah. I thought I think my father thought it was So um, Well what? when I was sixteen, Artie and I made a record, this Tom and Jerry record. So that was a hit record. Um, and we were just kids, you know, uh, and uh, we went on American Bandstand and all, but those were just kid, kid songs. But the Sound of Silence is probably my first sort of serious. So it became a big photo. seller, is that right? Well, yes, you're right. <laughs> so, um, and then a, a man named Mike Nichols. Well, you must have heard the Sound of Silence. I did, I remember it. I, uh, I said, I wish I could do that instead of having to go to law school, but I, I didn't have that skill. So I, I, you were contacted by Mike Nichols, who was doing, um, he was directing a movie called The Graduate. And um, when, had you heard of Mike Nichols before he contacted? Oh, yeah. Okay. I and, was a big fan of Nichols and May. Okay. So he said, you, can you do some songs for my movie? And did you tell him The Sound of Silence would be one of them or something else? How did that come about? And how did you write those songs? Uh, no, he asked me to write songs for, for uh, The Graduate. And I began to, you know, think about it and write some songs. And then when um, the next, when he next contacted me, he said, you know, we've been using the songs that you've already recorded as a temp track, you know, uh, the music that they just put in temporarily when, you, when they're uh, behind the scene, just to give them an idea. He said, but we've, we've come to like this, this stuff so much that we're thinking that we we're going to keep it this in the, in the movie a, as it is, you know? And then um, I was working on a song that I maybe was, sometimes I called it Mrs. Robinson, sometimes I called it Mrs. Roosevelt. It was, they were the two syllab, syllabically, you know, interchangeable. And uh, uh, Artie said uh, to Mike, Paul's writing, Paul's got a song called Mrs. Robinson. And Mike said, do you have a song called Mrs. Robinson you didn't tell me? I said, well, I don't know. It should be Mrs. Robinson or Mrs. Roosevelt. And he said, are, are you crazy? 
of course it's Mrs. Robinson. You know, we're making, we're making a movie here. When so, uh, but <laughs> it was a coincidence that you were writing about Mrs. Robinson and the character was Mrs. Robinson. Was that a coincidence or? Or he well, changed I, her name I, to Mrs. Robinson. No, no, I, I, I was singing. No, I wouldn't say it was a coincidence. You know, I, didn't have, I don't think there are much coincidences right. anyway. So there was a famous line in there about a baseball player named Joe DiMaggio. Right. And uh, you said, in effect, where have you gone, Joe DiMaggio? So was it always Joe DiMaggio that we were going to put in there? Or was it some other baseball player? And did Joe DiMaggio get upset that his name was being used that way? Joe DiMaggio was, I heard he was upset about it. Why the, I wrote that line, I have no idea. Uh, I have no idea. Okay. Which is quite often the case with, with lines. Um, but I recognized it as an interesting line. It wasn't, it wasn't random, right, okay. you know. But, when I saw, I saw him once in a restaurant, so I walked over, and I knew, I had heard that he was upset. That he thought it was uh, kind of hippie, hippies making fun of him or something. So I went over and I entered somewhat with some trepidation and introduced myself and said, you know, I wrote the song Mrs. Robinson. Well, by then he knew that the song wasn't making fun of him and there was a big hit and it was, you know, he was... The hero, a hero of the song, so he wasn't angry with me at all, but he said, well, you know, why, why did you write that, though? He said, where have you gone? He said, because I haven't gone anywhere. I make, <laughs> I, I'm in a Mr. Coffee commercial. I'm, <laughs> so, I had to do a brief, a brief uh, catch up about metaphors, whether Joe, it's actually, doesn't mean that, it actually means, well, anyway, it doesn't mean anything bad. It's a good thing, you know, so. So um, you later, in 1970, came out with an album and a song um, that became quite well known, Bridge Over Troubled Waters. And when you wrote that, did you say, this is gonna be one of the greatest songs of all time, or do you weren't sure? No, I said, that's better than I usually write. Okay. <laughs> but that was another example of a song that sort of comes through you and you say, hmm. Well, at then I did, you know. Uh, in years, as years passed, I began to recognize that that was a, an unusual and uh, um, inspirational kind of uh, occurrence uh, that this should come, you know, spontaneously and you don't know why and there's a little something mystical about, about it and it's, uh, Graceland had, uh, the song Graceland had that, that quality. Um, but is it true that you couldn't convince your partner then that to record the song because he didn't think it was that great a song? Um, briefly, yeah, briefly he thought that. But no, I mean, no, at first he said, no, I don't think I should sing this. I think you should sing it. And I said, no, I, it's, it's, be okay. it's better that you sing it. <laughs> I should have listened to him. And so okay. <laughs> so um, that became a, a, a Grammy uh, album of the year and song of the year and so forth. And therefore your fame became even greater. And you began to play um, in places like Central Park. What is it like playing in front of 150,000 people? You... It was a half a million people. Sorry. <laughs> and uh, that was the first time that, that I had played in front of that large a group. And uh, when we came off stage, I said to Artie, what do, you, what do you think? And he said, disaster. <laughs> you know, so it's like, we didn't, it wasn't until we got home and turned on the television and could see all the people being interviewed right. and saying, oh my God, you know. It, that was extraordinary. Then, then I played by my a solo right. concert in Central Park and that had 750,000 people. And then, which, so what happens is you're, you're the first time you do it, you're, you're, you're nervous, you know? 
I remember doing a concert with Artie years after that where we played in Rome in front of the Colosseum and there was 600,000 people. So by then, it's not that I was blasé or didn't care about it, but you get sort of relaxed. And uh, I remember I was standing on the stage and we're in front of the Colosseum and there's this long avenue there and there's 600,000 people and people are looking from the apartments and and he was singing a song that I just accompanied him on. I didn't have to sing, so I was just playing, and I'm looking around, and I'm thinking, I wonder what an apartment like that would cost. <laughs> you know, quiet, you know? Right. Well, well um, so um, when you're... So you get used to it, is what I'm saying. <laughs> when, when you're performing in front of 500,000 people, or 600,000, or 750,000, do you ever... Uh, lose track of the words? In other words, you ever forget, your mind wanders and you forget the words? Have you ever had that happen to you? Not often, no. Well, the way I look at this, for the most part, is if, you, if it's an event that has some historical meaning or, or if it's a big event, uh, I uh, do not consider myself to be part of the audience. You know, like... Uh, Joe DiMaggio, when he died, they asked me to sing at Yankee Stadium because they were going to unveil the monument. So I knew there would be 50,000 people waiting for me to sing, where have you gone, Joe? But for me, I wasn't, and I knew there would be a big roar, but I, for all I was paying attention to was how am I singing this, am I, am I in tune? It's like I'm not, I'm not the audience. I'm, my job is to do the performance okay. well, musically. Uh, so I, it's not like I would say, wow, I can't believe I'm here and then get distracted and forget the words. Right. That wouldn't happen. So before you came along and Bob Dylan came along and Carole King came along, performers usually didn't actually write the songs that they were performing. And you performed the songs that you had written. Um, what do you gave you better, greater pleasure, performing or writing, or just a combination you can't distinguish between the two? Um, I would say writing, but performing is, no, performing is pleasurable and, and gratifying too. Uh, but I, my writing was it more uh, developed than my performing. Uh, like around the time of Bridge Over Troubled Water. Now I feel like uh, my performances are, uh, there's an ease to it. And my singing got, got better. I don't know why, I'm, but I'm fortunate in that my voice okay. remained clear. And so I know more about how to sing and <laughs> phrase. And I learned that, but I learned writing earlier than I learned how to perform. So you um, did a solo album, just yourself, after the Bridge Over Troubled Water album and uh, Paul Simon album, and it had a song on there, Me and Julio Down by the Schoolyard. So who was Julio? Was he a real person or? Um, no, Julio wasn't an uh, amalgamation of people. Well, was there a real crime that you had in mind, the house of well, detention or? I don't, I didn't ever tell anybody that. Oh. Okay, would, all right. Would, somebody would have to have millions of dollars okay. that they would want it to. <laughs> so, uh, it's like uh, Carly Simon and her song, right? Okay. So, um, okay, then you came out with another album, album um, <laughs> Ryman Simon, right? I, I, Ryman Simon was another album and you, and you, had, you came out with, right? And that was uh, also a, a song that had Kodachrome in it. So did you actually have a Kodachrome camera when you were growing up? Uh, no. No. Oh. Uh, what happened with that was I was singing, I was writing the song and the way I wrote and still do is sort of by sound. Uh, so I was singing sounds or just words, and I was singing, going home, going home. And, but and I thought, well, I'm not going to call the song going home because, uh, I mean, that's just so uninteresting. It's a cliche. And so 
just looking for similar sounds. I came up with Kodachrome. And I said, oh, that's interesting. I wonder what that song will be about. Okay. All right. okay. So you then had another album that was <laughs> album of the year. And we we're going we're gonna to go through like. Uh, not all of them, like but some of them. The people want to know the answers to these. So then um, on your 43rd birthday, you had. Right, right. Well, people, when you wrote Still Crazy After All These Years, was, was that a message song, or were you referring to anybody in particular? Or? No, I was talking about myself, oh. <laughs> unfortunately. Okay. And then uh, after that, you decided to do something that was very novel. You went to South Africa and uh, played with South African musicians. Were you surprised at the controversy that was caused by that? I mean, I was uh, very aware of uh, the regime in South Africa and uh, apartheid, and, and I was also keenly aware that uh, we weren't meant to, no, nobody was, nobody in the, the community that I was involved with would, would perform there. In fact, uh, Artie and I had turned down uh, offers to, to perform there. But uh, recording there, entailed getting permission from the musicians union there, which is a black musicians union, and they, they voted on it and they um, invited me to come. So there was no, nothing against that um, as far as the, uh, well, it worked the, restrictions, out. Okay. the restrictions on. But, but, but after I went there, um, Yes, there were people who said, wait, what are you doing? You shouldn't be there. And that argument turned into a pretty, a pretty interesting argument because what it really was, when I went to meet with the ANC, the African National Congress, which was Nelson Mandela's party, and Mandela was still in prison. I said, look, we're, we're on your side. We're, we'll be happy to do a concert and for you or we're completely opposed to apartheid and, and, uh, and for you. Uh, and they said, well, look, the problem is uh, you didn't ask our permission. So I said, oh, so that's the kind of government you're gonna be? We have to ask permission now? Well, you have to, do I have to show you my lyrics? And uh, so basically in my discussions, I was really being advised and tutored by Hugh Masekela, who was, I don't know if you know Hugh Masekela, he was a great uh, uh, trumpet player and South African, and he was in exile from South Africa then, as was Miriam Makeba, who also was performing with me. But Hugh Masekela was a very astute political thinker and he grew up with, within the, the politics there. In fact, his sister Barbara uh, was Mandela's chief assistant when he, when he came out. So it was Hugh who was, said, look, this is, a, this is a question of politics. This isn't a question of morality. What they're saying is the musicians union can't decide, we'll decide for you. And they're, all, they're doing that because they, they want to be in control. Uh, but the, the truth is the artist should be in control. And I said, yeah, I'm, I, I, I agree with you. It's the, same, uh, it's the same in our country. The politicians use the artists all the time. You know, they'll have a fund, they're gonna run for office and have a, come and you know, do a fundraiser or come to a rally. And they, they, use, they use the artists to raise money or attract people. And then when there's a government, they never ask the artists anything. They don't ask them to right. participate, uh, nor do they think that artists have any great insight into how uh, government should, should operate. And the same was true in South Africa with the, with the ANC. They, because the Graceland troop that went out, including Ladysmith Black Mombazo and uh, different members, th there were, they represented quite a few different points in the political spectrum. For example, Ladysmith Black Mombazo was Zulu and came from 
KwaZulu, which is the Zulu homeland, uh, which is over on the uh, east coast on the Indian Ocean. So the ANC, Mandela's party, they were uh, Nkosa. They were they were a different uh, different tribe. Uh, there were Zulus in the ANC, but not Nelson Mandela. He he was from a different tribe from the Zulus. The Zulus were backing, um, they had a chief, uh, Budalezi was his name. And uh, so Ladysmith Black Mombazo, they, they supported Budalezi. Miriam Makeba and Hugh Masekela, they hated right. Budalezi. And Budalezi was actually kind of not, not really a good guy. Uh, when I said, w what's the problem, to Hugh, what's your problem with, uh, with uh, Budalezi? He said, well, the rumor is that the Zulus have made a deal with the Afrikaans that if there's a civil war, they'll join them, and right. when the war is won, their prize will be independence as a country. The Zulus were a tribe of five million people. It was a, right. you know, so... Uh, so that's where they stood vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the African National Congress. Now, at one point, Joseph Shabalala, who was the lead singer from Lady Smith Black Wambazo, said, Chief Budalezi would like us to come. He wants to have a dinner for you. And I said, uh, I don't really want to go to, I don't really want to go to the dinner for Budalezi. I'm not... I'm not uh, a Budalezi guy. And he said, no, you don't understand. They're, they're sending a plane. And he said, I, I got to go. I have to go. So I said, OK, so we'll go. Now, when they have a big dinner and they you know, slaughter a goat and they have dances and they give me you know, some gifts and things like that, and then the dinner is over, and the plane is gone. They were like finished with, kind of finished with us. So, and he leaves, boot lazy. And so Joseph and I are, are driving back to Durban. We would probably take a couple hours in the drive. So while we were on the drive, I said, "What's, what is the big, uh, the the seeds of the animosity between the Zulus, and uh, the Kosa people?" And he said, well, look, they're, you know, they're, they're like cousins. They're very closely related. And this, this argument goes back to the 19th century when uh, Shaka Zulu was, uh, was the, the chief of the Zulus and they were going to have a big fight with the, with the British. And the Kosas were supposed to join them. And uh, the time came for the fight. The Kosas didn't show up. So... And Joseph said, that's why the Zulu name for them means cowardly dog. So I said, well, there's a part of the problem right there. You know what I mean? <laughs> but when you came back, though, when you came back to the United States, you then took some of the music you had recorded there with the uh, right. Af mm -hmm. uh, South African musicians, and you wrote a song called Graceland, which had nothing to do with South Africa, but about your trip to Graceland. Did you actually drive to Graceland with yes. your son at the time or not? No, 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 and you, by myself. When you, went, you drove there, did you ask for special permission to visit Graceland or did you just show up with everybody else? And, no, I just showed up. And did people recognize you? And No, not, no. Okay. I got, you know, I bought my ticket, got on the bus, went there, walked through the, the whole exhibit okay. and the house and everything. And uh, I was thinking, God, this is, this is really pretty pretty tacky, you know, and, so. and then when you finish the tour, you come out into the garden, and there is his grave and his mother's grave, uh, and it said something like, Elvis Presley, whose voice touched millions of people all over the world, and I just started to cry. Because, uh, I mean, I was a huge fan, and I th thought it was, his work was brilliant in the beginning. And I was there because of, right. because of that. So, you know, it put, it in a per uh, put that in a perspective for me. You know, I thought, wow, this is actually, for a guy born in Tupelo, Mississippi in 1935, 
in the depression, uh, you know, and he's, he's, he's pretty special, you know. Well, the album came out and another album of the year, and it was maybe the most transformational album of that generation. It was like Sgt. Pepper's uh, Lonely Heart Club's band in terms of the, its impact. So were you surprised when it came out, what, how um, enormous the sales were and how critical, uh, how, how the critics loved it so much? No. Okay. I, I wouldn't have been surprised if it would have been a failure either. Uh, but I can't say I was surprised that people loved that music as much as I did. Okay. Because uh, I, I, I fell, in love with, in, fell in love with it. So uh, I didn't expect that people would automatically get it or like it. But I can't say that when they did that I was surprised. So um, in recent years, uh, you've done some touring and you draw enormous crowds, but you recently had your so-called farewell tour, which you ended in Queens, your hometown. Was that very emotional to have your last big touring uh, event in your hometown area? No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, you know, to the degree that I get emotional uh, about uh, performing because I, you know, I can't really drop my professionalism. It's so, it's so part of who I am, you know, that although uh, my wife Edie said to me on, when I began the tour, she said, look, be aware, since this is your last time, be aware that people are want to thank you for what you did and be, take it in. Don't, don't, uh, you know, don't just say, oh, this is, this is one show and, you know, we, we played well or I made a mistake here. She said, you should understand that people want to say that and you want to be able to say back, thank you. You want to do that too. So, yeah, it was, it, it, it was special. I won't say I won't say it was you know a okay. real emotional. I wasn't on the edge of tears or anything, but it was special. Most songwriters have their creativity in their twenties or thirties, and then when they're in their fifties or sixties or older, they're not writing as much. You're different. Uh, how do you think uh, you are different in that respect? You're just still writing songs, and you still enjoy it, and you're you're still writing now. Is that correct? Yes, I'm still. Yeah, I'm still writing. It's. Slower, slower now. Well, I stopped for a few years. When I, a couple of years before the last tour, I finished an album called uh, Stranger to Stranger. And when I finished, I said, I, it's almost like a, a switch went off and I said, I'm done. I said, I, I just, I don't, I don't think I can do, I don't think I can do this any better than what I'm doing right now. And I can do it as well, again, but in order, but to write an, uh, every album is usually what was taking me about three years to, from start to completion. And I said, I don't really see why I should spend three years doing a, another album that's about as good as this when I could be seeing islands in the South Pacific that I'm interested in. I could go to India, I haven't been there. I, uh, I, you know, it's not like I had an infinite amount of time in front of me. Uh, I said, I, I could use my time. My time would be better spent uh, by traveling. And I don't feel compelled to write. So uh, I, just let it, I just let it go. And I thought, anyway, if I do want to write at some other level, I think I have to stop totally what I'm doing and let it all go right. away and begin again. Uh, and so I did, and I didn't start to write again until I had a dream that said I was writing a particular, the dream said you're working on this particular uh, piece, extended piece of music. And so I said, okay, so I suppose I'm supposed to be writing this piece, so okay, I will. I'll, uh, I'll just see what, uh, what I write when I play the guitar. I'll write these as guitar pieces. And uh, so I have, but I haven't, I haven't put the words to it yet because I know that whatever I say, I know that this particular piece is going to be about the words. 
Uh, so one of the passions of your life now is dealing with environmental issues, conservation, biodiversity. Why are you so committed to that now? And are you spending a large part of your uh, time now working on these issues? Well, first of all, uh, I have uh, children and that makes me feel, uh, you know, ashamed that, and bad that um, we'll be leaving this, uh, you know, damaged planet to, uh, to that generation and their children. Uh, so I wanted to do something there. And then I had, uh, I had a, a chance encounter with E.O. Wilson, Ed Wilson. And uh, I had heard him talk uh, about 12 years ago at a TED conference. And he said something that was really inspiring. Uh, this is 12 years ago. He said, we have the potential to make this planet a paradise by the next century, which I, I, I thought at the time, that's true, it's so, it's true, it's so beautiful, we should. Uh, go back, skip ahead 10 years, and uh, I was doing an interview for this last album that I mentioned, and I did, really didn't feel like talking about the interview, so, or about the album. So I somehow I began to talk about Ed Wilson and his quote, and his uh, his assistant or his the person who runs his foundation, uh, Paula Ehrlich, is her name, and she contacted me and she said, "Would you like to meet Ed again?" And I said, "Yeah, of course, I would love to." So we met again, and he gave me his book Half Earth which is, I really recommend this book if you don't know it, uh, Half Earth, he, he wrote it about three years ago. And in the book he, he outlined, he lays out a plan for how we can save the planet. Um, essentially by putting, keeping uh, certain areas that are relatively you know, unscathed as far as uh, ecosystems are concerned. Uh, preserving those and letting uh, humans occupy the other part of the planet where we would be able to preserve about 80% of the species that are now living. And the, the, what, what's going on is that species, I'm sure this is not some news I'm telling you, but the, the, the uh, destruction of uh, species and the, uh, the uh, extinction of species is uh, progressing at an astounding rate. I said, well, uh, I write songs and I sing. I mean, what am I going to do? Uh, he said, no, you can, you can be of help and service. So I said, all right, you know, I'm going to do it. Next tour I do, I'll give all the money to, to you, to Half Earth Foundation. And uh, I did, and that's how I began. And I would talk a little bit about it when I do a concert, maybe for a minute, not too much. But when you perform now, large part of the proceeds are going to various environmental... All of it. Uh, all of them, okay. All the profits, yeah. Well, that's pretty generous of you and very nice. So, uh, <laughs> there, um, any you other know, causes? It's not, it's not even generous. It's simply a, a responsibility. You know, I don't... F I mean, what's generous is what nature has provided for us for hundreds of thousands of years. So uh, this is really, I don't feel anything about it it's special. Uh, it's just what I can do. That's why, that's why, I'm, uh, that's why I'm doing it. Okay, so while well, we only have time for really one more question which I'd like to ask you is when you look back on your incredible career, performing, songwriting, philanthropy, what is it that you're most proud of having achieved and what would you think your legacy should be? I really don't think about my legacy. I, I, have, no, I have no idea. Uh, and in a way, it's, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter, you know? I mean, it will be whatever it is or whatever it isn't. Right. The older I get, the less I care about 
critical opinion or, or something like that, or my ego is not quite as involved as it was earlier. So I don't think, I don't have to think about it. Whatever happens, happens, and I'm not planning my life. Okay, life, well, hopefully life. part of your legacy will be this interview. And um, <laughs> so I want to thank you for- I don't think so, but. <laughs> so, um, okay, you can call me David. Uh, <laughs> So um, thank you for coming here, and thank you for your interest in the Smithsonian, and we very much appreciate everything you've done for our society and the world. Thank Thanks you. so much, David. Thank you, thank you. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. I'm going to stand here right here. Thank you. Thank you. Are you giving me something? Yeah. Sure. Uh, I'm a medal. Yeah. Oh, OK. Oh, thank you. Oh yeah, I'm getting a prize. It's getting a prize. We're we're trying to help you with the legacy question. Uh, thank you so much, David, and thank you so much, Paul. Um, as David M. Rubinstein places this upon our incredible okay. guest's uh, uh, neck, I want to read the proclamation for you. The National Museum of American History proudly presents the Great American's Medal to Paul Simon for his global humanitarianism, environmentalism, for his commitment to the well-being of America's most vulnerable children, for building a bridge across generations with the sound that is as current as it is timeless, for his masterful lyricism and songcraft in which one simple stanza can change, challenge, comfort, inspire us to action, for his unwavering belief in the freedom of expression and the dignity of all peoples. Through these values and achievements, he defines service at the highest level and he exemplifies the true meaning of a great American. Given to you this day, the 18th of September, in front of your adoring fans, uh, 2019. We have a small gift for you. Um, we just showed you upstairs the original um, ticket booth at the original Yankee Stadium, and this is a replica of it with the graffiti on it as well. So, uh, small token of our appreciation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming. We hope you had an enjoyable time. Thank you for your support of the Smithsonian. And uh, final word? Oh, just on behalf of all of us at the National Museum of American History and the remarkable David M. Rubenstein and all of us here, thank you for coming and thanks for all you do to keep history alive and well. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.